In the late 1980s, the site of the Rose Theatre was uncovered, as it were, by accident in the building of a new tower block. And the dig on that site, I would say, threw up in a few weeks more knowledge about the design of theatre in Shakespeare's time than had been learned in the previous century or two. That dig led then to a, a dig nearby on the site of the Globe Theatre. Far less of that was uncovered, but crucially one key angle in the outer wall of the building was uncovered and measured, and that gave the size and indeed the shape of the uh, Globe replica that was built nearby. That body of evidence um, got everybody excited. There was a lot of theatre historians active in the period, and it coincided beautifully in the 1980s with the completion of the Globe replica near to the site of the original, where for the first time people could start to see drama of the period performed in something approaching the conditions in which it was originally performed. Not perfect as a replica, no one claimed it would be, but the goal had always been authenticity, respecting, of course, that's a very tricky term intellectually, philosophically, it's a hard thing to pin down. But with that goal in mind, the theatre put on, I think what everyone would agree is there's been a series of extraordinary productions exploring just how these scripts originally worked. Over the 50 years from the 1580s to the 1630s, in a word, what happens to theatre is it becomes respectable. Having started out as an extremely disreputable uh, occupation, it becomes highly reputable. But I would start the story earlier than the 1580s. Well, the interesting uh, events are really happening in the 1560s, 1570s, so if we want to understand where this theatre came from. Essentially, there were groups of amateur performers touring the land, relatively lowly capitalised, undercapitalised actors. They didn't have much money, they didn't spend much on their clothing or their um, scripts. And they were informal. In fact, they may drift in and out of the business and do other things. The key change before our period is in the 1560s, 1550s and 1560s, the state, the crown, the monarchy gets involved and essentially forces this industry to become um, more organised. It, it becomes required that actors have to have an aristocratic patron. And essentially, they have to acquire capital. That's the way I look at it. So that those who don't have capital are forced out of the business, and the few that do and can accumulate capital um, become rather successful. But they are still essentially touring companies. It's not until the late 1560s that anybody builds a theatre in London, and not till the 1570s, 1576 to be precise, that a proper permanent home for London theatre is built in Shoreditch, called, quite simply, the theatre. The story thereafter is that this design that James Burbage, an actor, has originated, which is an open-air outdoor amphitheatre, loosely modelled on Roman amphitheatres, but with a lot of Tudor, as it were, vernacular touches, so made out of wood, for example, not out of marble. Um, that style is copied by several others. They spring up all around. The first one, in fact, like a mushroom, appears right next to the um, theatre itself, north of the river, and then it spreads south of the river. Although if you plot these locations on a map, what you'll spot is that they're on the periphery of old London, not in the centre. And that's an interesting question for theatre historians. What exactly was going on in relation to the very wealthy centre of London? And the short answer is uh, the theatre people were kept out from the middle, at least for the first few decades. But they wanted to work in the middle. The actors were very keen to get close to their most wealthy audiences, right in the heart of London. So there's, essentially there's a struggle between the actors and the two forces with which they have to contend. We have to understand that London has, it were, two controlling uh, organisations. One is the City of London Corporation, which loosely represents the money, moneyed classes of London. And then off to the west, in Westminster, outside of London, is the home of the crown, the monarchy, the other great force. And those two forces are essentially locked in a struggle for power. Um, this struggle culminates in the English Civil War. In our period, in the late 16th, early 17th century, one of the means by which they carry out their struggle is theatre. That is, they, they sponsor theatre or they try to stop theatre. Um, they pass laws, they um, argue, negotiate, and essentially I, I would see them as using the actors as a kind of shuttlecock back and forth between the two poles. 
we know where that, that story is going in the sense of the civil war um, is what happens next. Of course, they don't know that this is coming. But you can, I think, plausibly read theatre as being a pre-revolutionary artistic flourishing. If you look through history at quite a few of the important revolutions, what goes on in art just beforehand is wonderfully illuminating of what's really going on in people's minds. What do they actually think matters in life? Where do they think power comes from? How do they think they should be ruled? What do they think is the correct role of women in society? What is our relationship actually with animals and with God? The, all the big questions, I would say, get um, aired, negotiated, confronted um, in the theatre. And it's a particularly interesting time because of this struggle between essentially the old aristocratic class and the new bourgeois class that is coming to dominance. The reason um, I say follow the money is that this is, from an economic point of view, a fascinating industry. Um, because of the amount of capital tied up in things like clothing, one thing the early actors, um, before this really became a professional theatre in London, the early actors hadn't spent much on clothing. One of the uh, key changes in the way they perform is that they spend fabulous amounts of money on clothing, stupendous amounts. The clothing stock of a theatre company would easily exceed in value the building they were performing in. And if we look at individual items, um, and we ha luckily have a few records kept of people purchasing uh, clothing, they might spend £15 on a gown for a patient, a patient Griselda, for example. Um, and when you do the calculation of what that is in modern money, which is hard to do, actually, it's not straightforward, but it's tens of thousands of pounds on a single item of clothing for one production. So that's where um, a Marxist approach, which looks at how capital is flowing through this industry, um, and actually looking at the regulation of the industry, starts for me to be very illuminating, because the theatre companies were rather like the merchant explorer companies. That is, they didn't operate within the medieval guild system, which had long regulated trade and, and exchange and production, indeed, in London. They were a new kind of business, a business in which people pooled their capital, formed a company. They needed some kind of uh, aristocratic or monarchical patent, as did the merchant adventurers. You need the, the stamp of the crown, as it were, to authorise you to do this. But once you do it, you're outside of anybody else's control. You can make as much money as you're able. You can lose all your money. This is a new kind of proto-capitalist way of running a business. And London hadn't seen it before. And one of its greatest um, uh, uh, expressions is the London theatre industry. Certainly those who worked in the theatre industry, we know, who were successful, became very wealthy. If you did, it, if you did this new thing right, you could become fabulously rich, as indeed Shakespeare did, as indeed Edward Alleyne did. He be Edward Alleyne became so rich that as part of his will, he founded modern Dulwich College. Um, so the, the rewards were virtually unlimited, but we don't know exactly where their money came from at the start. So the story is one of an increasingly wealthy theatre industry, from, starting from a very low uh, beginning, that um, particularly in the 1590s, starts to become successful. A key date for us here is 1594. In 94, um, the Privy Council orders that there will be just two theatre companies in London, and they have the sole right to play um, in London. No one else can. They have what is sometimes called a duopoly, a monopoly of two. Th those involved in those two companies, the Lord uh, Admiral's men and the Lord Chamberlain's men, become very rich very quickly. Because of this... Um, sole access to London, and also because they were very good. It's important that this company was, both companies were comprised of the very best that was available. The lesser companies essentially were forced out from London, and the best remained. And in the case of the Lord Chamberlain's men, they had a very good actor who was also writing plays for them, William Shakespeare. The other company tended to rely more on freelance writers, but they had the scripts of Christopher Marlowe to begin with. And these companies... Um, performed at two open-air amphitheatres, one south of the river, the Rose, the other north of the river, the theatre, and they stayed put. That was a new development. The actors previously had always tended to move around the country, or if they were in London, move between venues. But this 1594 Privy Council order made them stay put. They had to stay in their own theatre, which was something new for the audiences. The audience could now expect to find 
Shakespeare's fellow actors working at one place each day. They knew, they knew where to go. And if they liked the lead actor, whose name was Richard Burbage, son of James Burbage, who built the first theatre, if they liked what he did, they could come back each day and see another play because the repertory had a very fast turnover. They had a new play every day, more or less, in a cycle. You might have to wait four or five days to see your favourite come back again. And the same thing was happening south of the river with Edward Alleyne, the lead actor of the Lord Admiral's Men. These two actors, these two companies and their lead actors became stars, superstars of the London stage very quickly. Um, we know this because people spoke about how wonderful they were as performers. And the, the money poured in. Well, throughout the 1590s, these two theatre companies, uh, the Lord Admiral's men at the Rose and the Lord Chamberlain's men at the theatre, are, are successful. But for the Lord Chamberlain's men, there is um, something on the horizon they need to be aware of. They're working at the theatre in Shoreditch. This was built in 1576 by James Burbage, father of the actor Richard Burbage. And it was built on a piece of land for which um, Burbage had a 21-year lease. So they knew that in 1597, they would have to somehow negotiate a new, new lease or move. And in the event, they were unable to negotiate uh, a new lease. The old lease gave them the right to erect any buildings on this piece of land that they wanted to. It required them to make certain improvements to existing buildings, and it also gave them the right to take away anything that they'd built. This turned out to be a crucial clause, the taking away option. After their lease expired in April 1597, the company continued to stay at the theatre and pay their rent. This was a very smart move. Paying your rent under the terms of an old lease is usually in law taken to be an extension of the terms of that old lease. Their landlord was not willing to give them a new lease but was um, drawing the negotiations out. And whilst they continued to pay the old lease, they could argue in law that the, all the terms of the old lease were still in force. Um, and the crucial term was that they could remove the theatre when they left, which is precisely what they did. When they finally um, couldn't stay any longer, they first of all performed at a nearby theatre they had access to called The Curtain. But in the winter of 1598, whilst the landlord was out of town, they dismantled their old theatre, took it away and rebuilt it on the South Bank as The Globe. Or at least that's the story we used to tell. It's not entirely clear how much of a theatre you can take apart without destroying things. So some historians will say, well, they kept the main timbers and recycled those. Others would say that when they moved the theatre to form the globe, it really was the old building reborn. And that, we still don't know um, which of those two narratives is, is, is quite right. Some, somewhere in between is probably what they did. They recycled and, and preserved. It's very hard to know. When the Lord Chamberlain's men um, moved their theatre from Shoreditch down to south of London in um, the Bankside region and re-erected it as the newly built Globe, they were only 100 or two yards away from the Rose Theatre owned by Philip Henslow. We don't know how Philip Henslow reacted to this, but he cannot have been pleased to have his main rival company on his doorstep. We don't know whether his Rose Theatre um, was much like the Globe, or perhaps inferior to it. The usual story is the Globe was a, a more grand theatre, which is the last thing any impresario wants, is a better theatre next door. We don't know how this affected his profits. Uh, we have some records of his take, and there's some evidence that um, people voted with their feet and walked into the Globe rather than the Rose. We do know for sure that the very next thing Henslow did was erect a new theatre for himself, north of the river. So essentially the two companies swapped sides. In uh, Golding Lane, Henslow built the Fortune Theatre and its contract explicitly described it as being modelled on the globe. With one exception, rather than being roughly circular, this new Fortune Theatre was square. The amphitheatre um, style playhouses on the edges of London were new builds. These were buildings where there had been fields before. You couldn't build such a thing in the middle of London, but in the middle of London was where the actors wanted to be because that is where the most affluent customers lived and worked. So the theatre um, people always wanted to get into the centre of London if they could. 
And part of their struggle with um, the London Corporation was about whether playing would be tolerated right in the heart of London, inside the old city wall. In the 1590s, the Lord Chamberlain's men could see the closing of the theatre. They could see that their theatre in Shoreditch needed to um, either have a new lease or to be moved. And they had a brilliant idea for a new theatre. They managed to acquire part of an old Blackfriars monastery in the Blackfriars district, Blackfriars being an order of monks, and converted that into a theatre, an indoor theatre. So they took an existing building and made it into a theatre rather than building something new. But it took a lot of money. The conversion was very expensive. And the Burbage family, indeed, sunk everything into this new venture and intended to move the Chamberlain's men into this theatre, a much smaller space, um, a few hundred people rather than several thousand, as the uh, outdoor theatres could hold. But each person was paying much more, or was expected to pay more than they would in the outdoor theatres. It was a, an upscale move, essentially. This was a, a classy thing to do. But unfortunately, just as the theatre was being completed, the Burbage family learnt that they couldn't occupy it. They had essentially a petition of local residents to contend with, including, indeed, their own patron who lived nearby, who objected to this uh, development within the heart of London. So, having put all their money into the Blackfriars Theatre in 1596-97, the Chamberlain's men couldn't occupy it. And that's part of the background for the story of, of them moving their theatre in Shoreditch down to the Globe. That was, as it were, their second best option. That at least kept things going. They always had their eye on the heart of London, though, and what came later wasn't a chance to occupy the Blackfriars as well as the Globe. With hundreds of pounds sunk into the Blackfriars project, the Burbage family found themselves unable to occupy it in 1597 and instead moved south of the river to uh, build the Globe Theatre. But they owned the Blackfriars, or had at least, uh, they owned the theatre and had a lease on the land. And their stopgap solution was to rent it out to other companies. Not professional actors. The local residents would not tolerate professional theatre in their street. But there was a way around this. Boy actors, companies entirely composed of boys, who were receiving acting education as part of their general education, might be allowed to perform, say, once or twice a week, in what was technically, legally, an open rehearsal for which money was taken, rather than professional performance. This was tried and it was allowed. Boy companies performed at the Blackfriars from the late 1590s and in the early, uh, day, early days of the 17th century. Um, and successfully, it seems, the plays from this period survive and they are wonderful plays by the likes of Ben Johnson and uh, John Marston, George Chapman. And they developed a particular style that in fact may well be alluded to in Shakespeare's play Hamlet, when he refers to the little Iases. He um, has, in his play, a company of players describe a company of boy actors who are the talk of the town, who are producing topical satire, a genre that we know the boy actors at the Blackfriars were doing. A dangerous genre, a genre that can get actors into trouble, topical satire, but highly successful. And this continued for several years. There were wonderful plays performed at the Blackfriars. Until 1608, when the boy actors put on what seemed to have been one play too far, a satire that was just too offensive to those in power. It's George Chapman's The Tragedy of Byron, which seems to have offended those at court, particularly a foreign ambassador, and the boy actors were shut down. This was in 1608. The Blackfriars Theatre is owned by the Burbage family, uh, the Burbage Company, the, Cham the Chamberlain's men, had, with the accession of the new monarch in 1603, been elevated to become the King's men. They were now the monarch's actors. They'd risen in status. And it seems that when the boy actors left the Blackfriars in 1608, the Burbage family saw an opportunity now to occupy their indoor theatre. Indeed, to have two theatres, to use the Blackfriars in the winter months when it was cold, and to use the globe in the summer. That seems to be what they did, and they seem to have got away with it. There, was, there were no objections now to the professional players because they were the king's men being in the heart of London. From the late 1590s, 
companies of boy actors were performing plays in London written by some of our most uh, successful and brilliant dramatists, in particular Ben Jonson. And what Jonson discovered was that boy actors could do things that adult actors could not. In particular, a typical adult company would have mainly adult male actors with two or three or four boy actors who would play the female parts. What Johnson spotted was that with a company of boy actors, suddenly the stage can be filled with female parts. He wrote a series of plays with a lot of women in them. And they are extremely funny, and of course they engage with the contemporary sexual politics of the age. Wars of the sexes, for example, are, are, are a typical um, theme in these plays, related to other kinds of wars, class war, religious war. But in particular, Johnson um, had a talent for extremely funny scenes of women. The plays of the 1580s and 1590s that had been highly successful at the open-air amphitheatre theatres were plays, for example, that showed the history of England. That you might have to stage a battle, perhaps the Battle of, battle of St Albans, or a foreign battle, Agincourt. These plays might self-consciously refer to their own inability to put 5,000 soldiers in full armour on the stage, but they nonetheless could attempt some kind of realism. The stages were large and essentially outdoors. When theatre moved indoors, these plays were obviously much harder to stage. Uh, indoor theatres were smaller than outdoor theatres. The audience were much closer to the action, and staging the Battle of Agincourt really was not... Um, as easily achieved as it had been at the Globe or, or anywhere else. Dramatists responded to this by developing new kinds of drama, drama that um, was in some cases much more domestically oriented, tragedies that happen inside people's houses, inside families. These topics had been broached before, but it was much easier to represent intimate scenes, um, indoor scenes of, of great emotional tension at the indoor theatres, where there was some ability to, for example, control the lighting, and where the audiences were so much closer to the actors. The two kinds of theatre, the open-air amphitheatre playhouse and the indoor hall playhouses, had a different kind, each had a different kind of audience, essentially regulated by price. But it would be too simple to say that the rich went indoors and the poor went outdoors because anybody could go to an outdoor theatre, rich or poor alike. It was a penny to enter and stand in the yard. And we know that all social classes did go. One penny was a low enough entrance fee that almost everybody in the area could afford to go. The equivalent today would be about five pounds, so it was a, an affordable entertainment. But we know that aristocrats went. We know that foreign visitors to London would, would go to the theatres as part of their experience of London. And indeed, Ambassadors would organise trips to the open-air amphitheatres. They were entertainment for everybody. You paid your penny and you could stand in the yard as close to the actors as you liked, but really that depended on how soon before the performance you arrived. If you turned up at the last moment, you'd be at the back. If you really were an aficionado of this entertainment, you might come an hour before and get a space right at the front of the stage. There was no sense in which the amount of money you paid regulated how good a seat you had. Most people were, in fact, standing. But at the indoor theatres, they started the kind of system of regulation that we expect in a theatre. The more you pay, the closer you are to the action. So they had seating in the uh, pit area in front of the stage rather than people standing around the actors. And the more you paid, the nearer your seat was to the front. The price to enter one of these indoor hall playhouses was typically, well, the prices started at a shilling and went upwards. So 10 to 12 times more than you would play at the open-air playhouses. Each person in the audience was worth 10 times as much to the actors, is the way I would look at it. They only had to get 500 people in to have an enormous take for that production. That meant that these people were much better off than the typical open-air amphitheatre audience. The average um, person in an indoor theatre audience was a, a wealthy citizen or a minor aristocrat. That's the, that's the range. Artisans, workers, did not go to the indoor theatres. And one might actually see in this the origin 
of an idea about theatre that we still have as it being a preserve of the, the well-off and the educated. It started, of course, in our period, in the late 17th century, as entertainment for the working class. The theatre companies of the late 17th century were always patronised by some aristocrat and eventually, in the early 17th century, by the monarchy itself. The entire existence of this industry was indeed excused as being a necessary kind of preparation for performances at the court. At the Easter and Christmas holidays, it was typical for the court to be entertained with theatrical performance. And as an excuse, as it were, the theatre companies were allowed to perform plays to the public to get them ready for performance. We might expect that a play would first be performed before the court and then moved to the public. It was quite the opposite. Plays were readied before the public, before they were taken as perfect dramas to the court. Elizabeth patronised theatre companies, both personally as a patron and also by inviting them to the court to perform. And King James, it seems, enjoyed theatre even more than she did. So there was an increase in the number of court performances by uh, leading companies under King James's rule. Whether or not you think the 1590s and the early 1600s are the golden age of theatre depends to a large extent on how you feel about the audience, the kind of people who are going to the theatre and what would please them. In the 1590s, theatre was essentially an outdoor activity in London and this produced a kind of drama um, that was large in several different ways. Um, the leading actors were physically imposing figures. The plays were large. With the move indoors, a new kind of drama emerged that had a lot more emotional, psychological intensity. And with Shakespeare's retirement around 1610, a new generation of dramatists took over and produced a new kind of drama. Not to everybody's tastes, it must be said. So around about 1610, Shakespeare retires. His company, now the King's Men, have two theatres. They have an open-air amphitheatre in the suburbs, the Globe, and they have the indoor Blackfriars Theatre. And one way to look at this story is to see this as a division of the theatre industry into two kinds of entertainment. There's an old-fashioned outdoor theatre that is rambunctious and loud, and a new refined indoor theatre. With the move to the indoor theatres, the kinds of plays that could be performed in London acquired a greater range. Things could be done that could not be done before. But we shouldn't assume that the drama then became an indoor drama solely. The Globe remained highly successful. When the Globe Theatre burnt down in 1613, the King's Men didn't decide to stick only with their indoor theatre, the Black Fires. No, they rebuilt the, the Globe at great expense. They seemed to want to keep a foot in each of the two camps. And moreover, plays transferred from the indoor theatre to the outdoor theatre and vice versa. There was, in effect, one repertory for the two kinds of theatre. We have to think about how, indeed, you would change, say, The Tempest to perform it outdoors. You might wonder how a play written for the outdoor theatre might be moved indoors. They did do some of the old historical drama indoors, and they might have to modify the instruments used to make musical effects, for example. We have an eyewitness account of plays performed at the Globe in 1611, and they are Cymbeline and Macbeth. Macbeth, a play written before the move indoors and containing uh, a lot of loud, violent action, but also Cymbeline, a play we tend to think of as being uh, developed by this new aesthetic of the indoor theatre, but the only eyewitness account we have of it is a performance at the Globe. So we must think in terms, at least through the 1610s and possibly into the 1620s, of there being two kinds of venue, but essentially one repertory, at least for Shakespeare's company. <laughs>